Success stories and interviews with game changers and thought leaders who have overcome both in life and in business. Welcome to Vertical Momentum. Hey guys, check out the new episode, the new podcast. Appreciate you guys. Um, Just remember, if you guys want a podcast, there's no better way to do it than Anchor. Number one, it's free. Everybody loves free. Free, 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 free. And then you can also record and edit your podcast right here and not have to go anywhere else. And Anchor will also distribute your podcast to Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and many, many more. So guys, definitely, if you're looking to podcast, use Anchor. Love you guys. Hey guys, welcome to another episode of Vertical Momentum. I am your host, Richard Kaufman, also known as a Comeback Coach. Guys, you know when I have somebody on, whoever I'm interviewing are game changers and thought leaders, and my friend that we're having on both right now. But first, I want to thank our sponsor. Thank you, Soldier Girl Coffee. If you guys love coffee, definitely check out Soldier Girl Coffee. Now, she also has coffee that's infused with CBD for people that need a little bit of relaxing and stress, stress relief. So check out Soldier Girl Coffee. Guys, this is going to be a great episode. Uh, my new friend, Eric, actually d- did amazing things in uniform, and he's doing even better things out of uniform. He's t- truly amazing, so get a pen and paper out because you might want to write some of this stuff down. Eric, how are you, my brother? Can you hear me? Hey, can you hear me? I can hear you great. Can you hear me? Richard, I can hear you, brother. How you doing? Can you hear me? Yes, sir. All right, so we got comms. Woohoo! How are you doing today? It's one of those days, but I'm here for you, my friend. I'm so appreciative of you, brother. Um, I love all the new stuff you got going on. But first, you know, tell us a little bit about yourself and where you come from and what kind of little kid was Eric. <laughs> I was born the son of a sharecropper. No, I'm just kidding. So uh, I am a, a PK, you know, the worst kind, a preacher's kid. I grew up in Dallas, Texas. Um, you know, not not a lot going on there except for just trying to, you know, do the right things. Uh, father was, was really great, very inspirational to me. He's also a Vietnam vet. So, you know, I had some, some good uh, training and growing up. Basically, uh, I grew up like I was in the military. Um, my dad would do inspections on my room. And uh, so going, you know, going to the Army was the next step. Um, and so that's pretty much what I did. Now, were you good in school? Were you an athlete? So I pretty much, uh, I was an uh, athlete, band weenie. I did uh, baseball for one year till I figured out that that wasn't good for me. Ran track. Uh, so that was fine. No issues there. I um, uh, did a little bit of soccer for a couple of years. Uh, never really did the football thing. I didn't think I was uh, big enough or old enough to, to do that because um, I would always, you know, usually end up getting hurt or something like that. Um, and, yeah, uh, academically, yeah, I was a, a B-plus student, uh, and that's more so because I got bored in school, and so I would uh, – uh, you know, kind of leave uh, as most kids did, but I did mine the right way. My father always told me, as long as you're making good grades, you can call me. And uh, yeah, I will, you know, help you write the letters and, and take all the stuff. And so I would write my own letters and uh, leave school. And so it was a, it was one of those things where my father knew I was leaving school. Okay, so now I've talked to a lot of operators now on this show, and it seems that a lot of them are very, uh, they, they love to read, and they believe that readers are leaders. So were you a big reader coming up? Oh, I love all the, the, the literature and books and things like that that were out there. One of my favorite is, you know, like Gilgamesh, uh, Iliad and the Odyssey. I was really big on literature, so all the 
you know, the fabled and famed stories that kids have to grow up reading. Not so much the uh, the other subjects. Of course, math was was never my strong suit. But yeah, I, I mean, even to this day, you know, books on tape, CD, however you want to call it, uh, audio books, um, just reading anything that's out there that I think will enhance me. I'm not a big uh, fan of things that aren't true. Uh, at this point in my life, because I think uh, for me anyway, while they may be good for other folks, I just kind of like to educate myself. And so I'm always reading something. I love that. So, you know, I love everybody's recruiting story. Tell me your recruiting story. <laughs> so as a, as a young man, knowing that that's what I wanted to do, you know, parents had the college funds and things like that set up. I was actually uh, really gifted in music. I was able to read percussion music and, and piano and things like that. And so had a chance to do some some scholarships and, and those types of things. But when I was uh, in uh, the 11th grade, I decided that there was nothing else that I wanted to do but follow in my father's footsteps, go into the infantry. Um, and so I called the recruiter up, came to my house, um, basically, you know, talked to me, my parents, and so in the 11th grade, I signed up for the military. So right after graduating high school, I would already be going. And so my uh, my date was July 6th, 1989 was the date that I joined. But it was uh, June like 13th or so um, after I finished my 11th grade year that I actually signed the paperwork and was on the delayed entry program. So, you know, because I'm sure that when you when you took your ASVAB, I'm sure you crushed it. And I'm sure the recruiter was looking at you like, are you sure you want to do infantry? Because you could have so many different MOSs. So what was that conversation like? So um, they wanted me to do um, helicopter um, crewmen. But at that point in time, the only thing that I saw in my my mindset and in my eyes was was being an infantry soldier. Um, yeah, I had just right at the numbers, which everyone knows is 110 uh, for an ASVAB score. And so I could have done pretty much anything at the time. Uh, but the only thing I ever wanted to do was be infantry. And so as I chose that, I wanted to do the 101st. If everyone knows, you know, all the great movies that were out back then, Hamburger Hill and things like that. Um, and so that's what I wanted to do. And then the guy showed me, you know, ignorance on my part, the guy showed me the 82nd Airborne patch and I wanted nothing to do with it because I it just didn't look like the Screaming Eagle. Uh, and so I ended up basically just picking to go to Germany, which I thought was going to be uh, a great place, which it was. And me and you probably met up in Germany and had a, we probably hung out and have a beer had a beer together because that was about the time that I was in. So tell us about, go, you know, getting selected to go to, uh, you know, uh, to be a Green Beret. Tell me about the selection process. So I, I'll, I guess to get to the selection process, I will tell you that after being, you know, in the infantry, I had done all the things like Audie Murphy, um, Saw Morales, those, those things where you can go and show how great of a, soldier you are understanding your troops and things like that had been to you know desert storm and bosnia and, and all of those places uh had been a platoon sergeant you know as a e5 promotable things like that which doesn't count um i had just gotten tired of how the you know regular army which i still love had gotten more into area beautification not really training the troops uh, and so I was already ranger qualified. I was on Fort Hood, just kind of hating life, uh, not really enjoying it. I went running one morning and uh, I saw the SF recruiter, something that I always wanted to do. So I ran in there in my PT clothes and I got to tell you the story. Uh, and, and the gentleman uh, that was in there when I ran in, he kind of looked at me and was like, ah, oh, come back later. Like, you know, you're going to waste my time. You're not going to be the fit that we need. And so I, I went back to my battalion, showered up, changed clothes, came back. And you know how it is. You got your 201 file on your shoulder. So now I have a, a CIB, a Ranger tab uh, and, and a combat patch. 
Uh, and I walk in there and the gentleman goes, oh, and I said, yeah, that's what I thought. He said, when do you want to go? And I said, what's the first thing smoking? And so that's how I ended up um, going to selection. And, and I will say that, you know, one of the best things I've ever done, uh, no quit attitude, really didn't train for it. It was more of a mindset for me. Uh, selection was, you know, still a little bit different because you go in there with guys who come from, you know, storied Ranger Battalion and 82nd Airborne. And here I am, this mechanized infantry guy um, as an E6 going to selection. And so, um, you know, really, I would say mindset and just understanding what I really wanted was probably uh, more of um, kind of what what was my driving force so to speak. Okay. Now I interviewed Lieutenant Colonel uh, David five coat last week, and he was in, ch in charge of the brigade of the, the training of Ranger and uh, airborne. And he said th the biggest thing was people's mindset, th the never quit attitude, you know, cause like you said, in a lot of operators I've talked to say if 200 were starting the class, maybe 30% actually finished the class. So what, when you seen people quitting around you, what made you not want to quit? <laughs> well, you know, it's, it's, and, and I'm going to probably delve into a little bit of things that may, people don't want to hear, but I hope it doesn't get cut out. So one, no, this is all about you. And this is all about, <laughs> you know, people learning, you know, this is real life stuff. And, this is not fluff. I love it. And so, Let's let's start with, you know, as we all know, I am a darker skinned American and I and I love the fact that I'm an American. I will never put anything in front of that. That's number one. Number two, um, growing up in the infantry, there weren't a lot of, um, you know, uh, African-Americans. Right. They 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 basically just were told that you need to go get some type of career in the military that's going to get you something on the outside, as if being a supply sergeant or something like that was going to give you that job. However, I am also a fan of history. I know that many of our brothers and sisters of all colors, races, creed fought to be able to fight for their country. So for me, that is part of my mindset. I am not going to let someone tell me what I can and can't do. And believe me, I had more of my own tell me I wouldn't make it in Ranger School. I wouldn't make it in Special Forces. And so growing up the way my dad, dad's a preacher, being in the, uh, Vietnam and just, you know, we don't look at color, creed, white, black. You know, I judge each person for each person. And so that's really kind of my, my driving factor. And so one of those things of just, you know, always looking within myself, looking at the history of our ancestors who triple nickel, you know, Tuskegee Airmen, things like that, uh, that, that just, why would I want to let someone, you know, tell me what to do? So going to the people around me that would quit. Now there's all kinds of folks that quit. However, sometimes there's clusters. When I was in selection, I can tell you, and I remember it like yesterday, there was a group of black gentlemen who all clustered together one night and were like, we're not going to make it. They're not going to pick us. And so we're going to leave. When I woke up the next morning, five of those guys were gone. They self, you know, selected out for themselves. Me, not doing that. You're going to have to tell me to leave. And so... That's what I did. Every day I woke up, I said my prayers, I thank God, and I basically went out and gave the best that I could do. And so, like you said, mindset. If you let anything enter into your mind to stop you from doing something, guess what? You're already defeated, sir. You know, I love that. Yesterday, I had the privilege and honor to interview a gentleman named is Jesse Awuji, and he is the first... Uh, black NASCAR driver that's also a United States Naval officer. And the funny thing is, the whole time we talked, he never talked about being an African American. Everything was, I'm an American. Exactly. Bottom line, that's it. And then, I, you know, I asked him, I said, you know, 
because a lot, you know, a lot of people, as we all know, um, they talk about, you know, how this country, how it is now. And I still believe that this is the country with the greatest opportunity in the world. So what are your thoughts on, like you said, self-limiting beliefs and also this country, you, you're able to get whatever you want to work for? Oh, absolutely. It's, it's basically like if, if you think about all the different uh, political parties and things like that, like, you know, right now we're, we're in a time where it, it really is just we just need to get together and remember who we are. Americans. That's that's it. At the end of the day, I have traveled this globe in all my different facets. And, and there is nothing better than this country as far as giving us an opportunity. As far as, you know, working as hard as you can. Does it always mean that you're going to be successful? No, but it's, you know, waking up every day, getting off your, you know, getting off your own high horse. Stop, you know, basically like just woe is me and, and trying something new every day. There, there you know, I see it. If, if you don't want to go work at McDonald's, hey, man, if that's what you got to do you know, to get yourself moving, maybe that's what you need to do. I mean, you know, I'm a, I'm a serial entrepreneur. It is a hard life out there. However, I'm not quitting. But that's what all of those schools, Ranger School, you know, going through selection, all of those things taught me that there's always a tomorrow. Like we would always say, you know, the joke, the running joke was I'll quit tomorrow. And after 12 o'clock in the afternoon, which is really the start of some people's day, we're like, okay, day's over. Man, we had so many other things and harder things to do after that. But with that mindset, I'll quit tomorrow or today's already over, so I'm already into the next day. I mean, that's what we should wake up and do. To see the possibilities that we have, to see all the programs that are out, basically just show the world that we are you know, the, the country that is full of limitless possibilities. You know, I love that. And like I said, when I was interviewing Jesse yesterday, you know, he graduated from the, the Naval Academy and then, you know, jo- became a Naval officer. And then one day he said, you know what? I want to be a NASCAR driver. <laughs> and he said, and there's no rules in this world saying you can't be. You just have to go for it. Exactly. No, said so, a lot of people I think are just afraid of either what everybody's going to say about them, what people are going to think about them, or they have the self-limiting beliefs that, oh, well, I failed at something, else, so I'm going to fail at this, so I'm not even. Hey, all these, uh, you know, huge entrepreneurs who, I mean, you can read the books about it. Most of them, if you've ever read like Rich Dad Poor Dad, some of those, you know, failure. Robert. I love Robert Kiyosaki. That was the first business book I right. ever read. And, and some of those guys, many of those guys, they failed before they got it right. Do, we, do any of us like failure? Absolutely not. I mean, I, my, my Ranger tab doesn't say R, 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 Ranger on it. I had to recycle. You know, when I went through the medical course, it doesn't say medical. It just says Special Forces Medic. I had to recycle that too, but it was about not giving up, but it's also showing people that you are going to be there day in and day out. And so whenever they have to make that decision of, do we keep this gentleman around or do we get rid of them? That can do attitude is what makes people keep trying to help you because we all know you can't do anything in this life by yourself. Uh, uh, now, what rank did you finally? I got to? to the rank of master sergeant promotable. I like to say to my promotable, even though it doesn't mean anything. And then uh, I, I went ahead and retired. Uh, I had an opportunity at the State Department to be a part of a program that was brand new. And so I took that opportunity. So, you know, well, a lot of people that are listening to this are veterans, entrepreneurs, both. Um, you know, sometimes life is great until you start hitting ranks of like E5, E6, E7. And that's when all, a lot of the politics and paperwork bullshit comes about. And sometimes we get away from, we stop being leaders of men. So what was your, like for me, you know, when I became an NCO, I lived the NCO tree. That's the way I lived my life. So talk to us about changing from being an NCO, you know, like a buck to now being leaders of men and how to lead. So it's, it's, it's really about, in my mind, uh, 
you know, not forgetting where you come from, understanding uh, your operational environment. And I will say this again, and I'm sure people have heard me say it before. One of my, you know, greatest mentors always told me, you can't lead what you don't understand. And so with that statement, it was always trying to, I mean, listen to your, your, the folks that you have and that you're in charge of, uh, making sure that you're continuing to educate yourself because what, what brought you here is what we say is not what keeps you here. So just because you were this, you know, uh, person who were, were great at everything, not everyone's a great leader. They may be great at shooting or all of those things, but without listening, right? You just can't really understand what your folks are going through, which was also, you know, and I learned that, uh, I would say, in a roundabout way, you know, like I said, part of the reason I left the regular army was just, you know, dealing with everyone's family issues and, you know, young Joe's not actually really wanting to uh, take ownership of their actions. And so I wanted to go somewhere where everyone basically had that zeal, that drive, who thought like me, who just wanted to do the job. And so I think as leaders, we always have to take that step back. You can't just, you know, all of a sudden there's these folks who they make it they forget about where they came from, and then they start, you know, really trying to be this this mean person, or you want to be, you know, hard as woodpecker lips, and forget that you were once that person too. It's almost like you know, adults, parents, we we you know we do the same thing. Came from, and you you know, be the best leader that you can. I love that. So you did what over oh, almost. 16 years? So I did 25 years about uh, in the military. Uh, of those, 17 were in the special forces. I was fortunate okay. enough to get the rank of sergeant after a couple of years. So I, I basically spent almost my entire uh, career in the military as uh, an NCO in a leadership position. So now when you finally did retire, um, did you find anything was off mentally at all? <laughs> Who isn't? Um, well, there's all kinds of, uh, as you know, we have, uh, a lot of folks, we talk about a thing called operator syndrome and just how, you know, different people are and we grow and you hear it all the time. It's like, well, you've changed. Well, that's okay. Change is good. You know, people will change. We, we, we grow up. We get educated. Um, are there certain things that, you know, we, we kind of tend to be uh, really different at? I can tell you I'm probably more short and, and, and not by height, uh, just by how I deal with things. But I, I try to curb it. Um, you know, there's the uh, really not liking to drive anywhere because most people are too busy and in their phones. I'm an A to B person pimping it. I'm not, you know, trying to show off my ride or anything like that. Um, and so, yeah, for me, it's just, it's really about trying to go day to day, have your tribe around you um, and, and deal with whatever issues you have. You know, for me, it's shortness of temper. It's, I don't really sleep so well. It's um, not wanting to put up with uh, a lot of the BS or just really kind of wanting to be left alone, more to speak. And I think a lot of us in the military, when it comes to the civilian uh, private sector, you know, we're so used to having a regiment and understanding the way things go that when we get out here in the civilian uh, world and, you know, I, I was told, I, I took a job with a good friend of mine. I was uh, a security manager. And he would call me and say, hey, man, you're doing a great job. But some of the people are like, you're not, you know, you're not saying how good of a job they're doing. And, they're, and I'm like, because it's their job. But I get it. Some people need that pat on the back. And so I think, you know, we take for granted as former military folks or people who are just go getters that 
not everyone is like us where, you know, we, we do an internal um, assessment of ourselves and we get strength from within versus folks who need strength from the outside. All right. So now, you know, a lot of people, you know, when they get out of the military, you know, we're all hua hua, but we do get coddled in a way. You know, we're so used to getting paid on the first <laughs> and the fifteenth. You know, for gets get, we get used to SGLI, BAQ, all that good happy stuff. And then when we hit the streets, a lot of us have no plan, no mission. We we miss our our comrades, and we get totally lost. So, what was your transition like? Well, I would say mine is different, and it was because I had, you know, uh, a government job right out of the military working for the the State Department. I was surrounded by uh, friends who had come from some of the same units. Uh, I was surrounded by mentors who had came from those places. And so I would say I had a transition that allowed me to still kind of be around that tribe. And I know that everyone can't do that. Maybe not everyone wants that, but I really think, you know, really big, the tribe is, is, is definitely a huge thing. And when I keep this, this tribe of, of things, that's usually the, the book, the essence, the, that's what everyone needs to try to get to because Going cold turkey, it's like, you know, even someone who's addicted to certain things, cold turkey doesn't work uh, for everyone. And so I would say do that. And that's why, you know, my transition is a little bit different. Um, Even in my uh, my business, I still deal with some of the same people. So I didn't necessarily leave right away. And so for those who are, you know, looking for that answer that was that was my answer to it was basically just you know staying in contact but we all know that different units different folks uh have a a a different uh way of you know letting that stuff kind of slowly work its way uh to where you can deal with it you know and i love that now you know i it's like one of my um, good friends, Nick, says, you know, he, he was a sergeant first class in the military, you know, that once you get out of the military, the minute you step off of Fort Hood, nobody gives a <laughs> shit about you. Your your phone stops ringing. You know, you're no longer sergeant first class or whatever rank you were. Now you have to fit into the civilian world. So what was it like when you finally had to get into the civilian world and started your own business? You know, because a lot of people I talk to, you know, they get out of the military, they want to start a T-shirt company, coffee company, or liquor company, and ten months later they're ten thousand dollars in debt and don't know what the hell just happened. So, what was it like starting a business from scratch? Well, it's still hard. Um, I mean, and and believe me, we all got our bills. I, 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 I that's why I was telling you today was not the greatest day for me because I woke up to tons of those. Uh, and I hear the stories from many entrepreneurs that are also military who, who tell me it's like five to seven years. And I'm like, man, I'm only in year two um, before they really start making any money, uh, basically living off your military retirement. And most of that goes to your business. Um, you know, how do you pay your employees? How do you pay your rent? How do you pay your mortgage, car payments, all those things? Um And so, you know, it really was a transition into, like, I I left the State Department, I came down to Texas, I got a job with a a good friend of mine, because I wanted to get into the private sector, because I just, you know, they say after you do something for 30 years, it's insanity if you keep doing it. Uh, And so, you know, I I looked at my skill sets, my education, what it was that I could do, and, and, and I formed this company. Um, and it's just really hard trying to get business. You're still new. Uh, you're, you know, you're stomping the ground. Um, it's trying to talk to people and reinventing yourself every day. It, it, yeah. If you want to talk about hardship, like 
starting a business is not an easy thing unless you just have an influx of money or you have the greatest credit score on, on the planet. And anyone who started a business know you could have started with the great credit score. And, and by now, uh, until you really start making money, that thing just starts to, to go down and you don't even want to look at it anymore. Um, and so, you know, I like having started my business. I have learned an awful lot. I have failed at a lot of things. Uh, I have had some 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 minor wins as well too, um, but I'm just going to keep trying. And there are mentors out there. The government has a lot of things. It has the SBA. It has you know uh, veterans administrations. There's your your local uh, city council things like that. Yes, you got to get in those doors, and you may not you know get the door open that you wanted at the time that you you thought you needed it, but you know. It's about not quitting. Do you still have other things that you can do? I mean, there are part-time jobs. Like I said, there's McDonald's. There's, there's whatever it is that you need to do, but it's that freedom. My, uh, my mentor said, you know, I actually tried to go back to the State Department at one point in time because I just, I just couldn't, you know, take it anymore. And I was like, let me take a break. Let me do this. And I was able to do that. But in the end, you know, he looked at me and he said, um, you are no longer a number, meaning, you know, I'm not the, the troop star major or the, you know, the, the deputy uh, at the State Department or something like that. You are a person who needs to be running your own shop. And so when you take that into context, it, it just means you just got to keep, you know, keep trying at it until, you know, like, you know, you've given it your you're 120%. And then if it's just not working out, then that's when you, you know, you move on. Now, are you married kids? Married, two grown men. Uh, one of my sons is a captain in SAG. He just went on his first six month uh, somewhere on the continent of Africa. Um, spitting image of his old man, older son. I, I love him to death. He is uh he is his own person, uh, has always been musical genius, you know, uh, like many. Uh, he learned how to play music without having a lesson a day in his life, uh, but it's just not paying the bills. So now he works at a warehouse and I'm, I'm happy for that. And I tried to tell him that growing up, you know, and these kids, they grew up around special operators their whole life. Um, and But, you know, they each make their own way and I'm, I'm glad they're doing that. Okay, I love that. And, you know, the reason why I ask, because, you know, a lot of guys will, because I'm talking mostly to guys, um, you know, they, they want to start a business, but they don't have that hard conversation at the kitchen table with their significant other until shit hits the fan. <laughs> and then they got to have an even harder conversation at the table. <laughs> so what was that conversation like when you decided to say, you know, listen, we're going to start our own company. Things might be a little bit of tight here and there. So what was that conversation? So, like? you know, my wife and I'm fortunate enough to be married for 30 years. Uh, I know a lot of my peers, their own second, third uh, marriages. Um, and that's just because she's just strong and she sticks with me uh, even through my craziness. Um, and I would say, you know, being, you know, open about it is I just do stuff and she lets me kind of thing. Uh, it's not that she agrees with all of it. And so that's the honest truth. She will, you know, put me in my, my lane, uh, when it needs to be. And she knows that we, we have hard times and, you know, really, I just try not to, and I know that's probably not right. I try not to bring that stuff to her attention. I mean, she put up with me on all the deployments and going all those places. And now she's got to deal with her son doing the same thing. So I, I really try to keep some of those things um, just away. But she does know, like, you know, her 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 biggest complaint is three years in the government and now you're still gone because you're traveling around and you're trying to freaking uh, get business and you're trying to get people to recognize, you know, wh who the company is. And so that, that's that's hard for her. I mean, for me, it's like another day at the office. I go, you know, I wake up in the morning about seven and then I'm off to the office and 
I don't come home till maybe seven thirty, eight o'clock. And then I open my laptop up again and I start working and then we eat and then I, I go to bed and I wake up and do it again. And then if there's a, a small gig that I can do helping people out with medical things or trying to get business for the company, um, I'm gone. And, you know, one of the things she tells me is you have no idea how much you're gone. And, and, I, and I get that. I don't really think about it that way. I just think about I don't want to fail. And so I'm just going to keep trying and, and, and in hopes of being able to create some, you know, generational wealth uh, for my family. So my grandkids, my sons, you know, all of those folks that come behind me, you know, we're not you know, struggling day to day. I'd rather struggle now for my family tomorrow. I love that. So talk to us, tell us what business you're in and what you actually do. So Gray Ghost, uh, I would say is a consulting company. So, you know, some of the things that we've done, I would say we have more, uh, four lines of effort, excuse me. And that is, you know, medical planning. So when I was at the state department, we had these planners who, if the secretary of state went anywhere in the world, we would make sure that, you know, they called it rocks in the river. What hospitals can he go to? Where can you stop your, your airline in the event that some sick, ill, injured? Now we had a medical doctor um, who is my mentor on that plane with all of those secretaries of states. And that was something that was new that was started uh, with our office. Uh, while it was done before, it just wasn't, really done correctly. And so we fixed that. Then it was, you know, sending out uh, what we deemed a guardian. So we would put uh, special operations, medical personnel from the SEALs, from special forces, from all of these places uh, on the ground. So after Benghazi. And so my company really takes what the State Department and what we did with that office uh, into our core being. So out there that's looking at business continuity we do those things you got uh, someone that's getting ready to travel to the olympics or go on some crazy hunting trip in turkey which we've had people ask us about you know we give them a good risk assessment we tell them where their true hospitals are we have a sister company uh nourish medical that anywhere you are in the world they will go get you. And so, you know, and they're former navy guys and baltimore shock trauma guys and so we partner up with them Now, uh, because of COVID and because, you know, things just kind of stopped moving, I've started like trying to create a security school for the state of Texas. And so levels two through four, you know, doing close protection, like there's a lot of companies out there that do close protection. So I was trying to kind of stay more in the medical field. However, many of these companies that I've seen, and like I said, I've traveled Mexico, was down there for two years, things like that. These companies are just putting big guys in your face that don't really know how to get, you know, their way out of a paper bag. And I mean that in the nicest way. And but a lot of people will pay for them because they have the big names. And then lastly, we really want to bring that medical education to people. I've partnered up uh, with another company called MaxFi. These guys have the only source for uh, training and to use cadaveric medicine where you know, hospitals, all these folks can actually train people without hurting an actual patient. And so now we're just trying to do education and we're trying to, you know, bring to light that I can do any surgery on the planet with this, uh, this tissue model uh, and not hurt anyone. And basically, you know, using uh, God bless them families who have donated their their family members' bodies to science for the education of military and medical professionals. And so that's really what we're, we're doing today. And I appreciate you asking that. Well, of course, you know, cause now to break it down, Barney style, you know, <laughs> we, you know, to, to, you know, to, to a smaller degree, you know, I, you know, they say in business or in life that if you don't, if you don't, uh, if you fail to plan, yes, sir. you plan to fail. And it sounds like that's something that you, you guys are, you know, are ahead of the front. So can you talk to us about, you know, definitely planning for success, but also having a something to 
you know, we like, like in the military, we always had a plan A, a plan B, a, B, a C, D, E, and F. But a lot of people, like when they first started business, it's only plan A. And then, like, you know, Mike Tyson says, <laughs> everybody's got a plan until, you get, until you get punched in the mouth. And so then talk to us about getting a plan, but also having being able to pivot and deviate from that plan. So um, I guess so what I did in the beginning and all of the at SB, if you're doing any SAM work, you know, trying to do government contracting, which we've we've done a little bit of. It is having that plan. So I reached out to a freelance uh, business planner. I reached out to a freelance business planner and I, I just, you know, I had a conversation with her because, you know, again, like you said, I'm a military guy. I'm a government guy. I know how we do our plans, but I wanted to do it the way that the private sector does. And so she actually sat down with me. Uh, and I, when I say sat down, um, you know, we talked over the phone hours on end and just listened. Um, and then she, you know, broke it down like, OK, so what I hear from you is you, you're really concentrated on the medical, but you also have these security things. But you can also be a consultant and you can. And so she helped me uh, do what we call our silos, having those three to four things. And then she asked me, well, what primarily do I want to do? And so we did that and we made the business structure pretty much on the one or two things and then leaving the other two kind of on the back burner. And then as we started to go along, you kind of see where you may be making a little bit of money. And so you you kind of push those a little bit more. And then when that starts to fail, um, then you start reaching out to the other plans that you have for the security aspects and for the consulting aspects. Um, and then as we continue to go along, like, who do you want to partner with? And I've been blessed enough to have people call me and you don't partner with everyone. But then you see that vision when you talk to each other and then you create another plan. And it's like anything else. I, I was on a mountain team. Years. And, you know, we don't make one anchor. We made three just in case one would fail. The other two would hold. You know, you got that last ditch effort of the other one failing for you. Just like we have pace plans in the military, primary, alternate, contingency, emergency. Who wants to get to that emergency? But you got to do it. Uh, what I've found in a lot of businesses and things like that, uh, private sector is just, you know, they may have an A. They may have an A and a B, but no one ever thinks about, you know, that that hard look. And of course, that takes money for most of those businesses. And so that's really how we have, you know, gotten this far. And and again, we're still trying every day. COVID has done what it's did for everyone. So we're not going to make excuses for that. Um, but, it, you know, it's making sure that you continue to talk to people. I would always say, have those mentors in your business. Even if that person is a uh, competitor to you, if they've been in the business, you know, 10 years and you've only been in business for two, guess what? You can have a conversation with them. They're not going to give you their proprietary information, but, but they just may want to help you too because a lot of these businesses have overflow. If they get too busy, maybe you become that easy button for them to help you gain, you know, some type of followership. You know, I love that. And I just didn't start thinking, you know, if we look back from a year today we, and, and somebody says, you know what, I'm going to go into the face mask business. We would have thought that they've lost their minds, but now there's companies out of there making millions of dollars off of face masks so sometimes you just have to pivot with the time yes sir you know what i mean that is absolutely true so now how do we find last two questions how do we find you how can we support you and how can we support any missions that you're doing that we can help you with so i will say you know outside of just you know making a living one i want all the veterans all the law enforcement ems people like that you know, we've created Operator Syndrome uh, with Dr. Chris Free and some great other psychologists out there. We're really trying to get people to understand that and to help our veterans with that. 
So, you know, if you don't help Eric Gray and Gray Go Solutions, please, please, please look that up. Uh, and you can find that at info at greyghostsolutions.com or just go to our website, greyghostprivate.com. The other things, like, you know, really it's just about trying to reach out to the right people. We're not asking for a free pass. We're asking for, you know, an open door so that we can sit and speak with you, look at your business continuity plans, look at your planning, look at your security implications, you know, things like that. And again, like I said, I, I really appreciate you, Richard, and how you are, you know, a lot of people don't want to hear those things. They just want to hear the background, but it really is, it's the American way, right? It's, we're trying to help uh, each other. And I would say the same thing to you, sir. How can I help you uh, do the great work that you're doing? I guess just help, just share this episode whenever it comes out. Now, you talked about Dr. Chris Free. So, Dr. Where's Free uh, lives in Hawaii. Hi. I just yes. interviewed him. I just, Last week, that I just interviewed Dr. Free. Buddy. So, he is a buddy, a friend, a mentor, and a psychologist for me. Um, and, 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 and he can't help everyone. We, we talk about this because I talk to Chris probably every other day, if not every day. Um, and so... Like we're really just trying to find a space, get some some good information out there. Help like we did a program, and I'm sorry if I'm taking up too much time. We did we, no, we did a time, program uh, with one of the agencies where we brought five uh, members in with their family member, just their significant other. And it was a week-long program. We did it at a great place out in the middle of Texas on a lake. And you know, he was able to speak to each one of them individually. He was able to speak to each one of their spouses. We did things like cognitive tests. He brought in Dr. Jay Weinstein out of Atlanta, right? And now we're doing moving, communications, medical. We're doing because our goal with this one group was one, they needed a pre-class for the training that they had to go through. But their, their boss wanted to see who was still cognizant of mind after all the years of being operators to do this job. And so we were able to do those assessments. We were able to see, you know, the deficits that many of us have. But it's not about the person can't continue to work. It was about... How do we help bring these people back to zero so that they can go beyond that? And it was a great time that we had. And, and Chris did an awesome job. I just did the training piece, Chris did the, the mental portions of it. And that's really our passion. Like if I could do that every day, that would be, you know, I keep trying to tell Chris, we're going to do it, brother. We're going to, we're going to make a way. Um, but to date, you know, it's just, we get, you know, we get a little hindrance here and there, but that hasn't stopped us. And we just did another uh, operator syndrome uh, po uh, webinar with um, David Rutherford. I don't know if you know him from Frog Logic uh, with Dr. Kate Pate and Jay Weinstein and, of course, Chris Free. And, and we just put that on our on our YouTube site. And so, yeah, definitely, I would say like that's. Those are the number one things that we, we really want to do. And, I, and I, I truly believe, you know, God willing, the rest will will come uh, as people see that we're just trying to be genuine in what we do. I love it. So that, that's amazing that I, I, you know, I talked to Chris last week and now I have the honor to talk to you. I think that's pretty cool. Um, last question. You know, we live in a crazy world. You know, we got grandparents teaching kids homeschooling. We got parents trying to work two jobs just to, where they were making enough money at one job where they can't make it anymore. So, you know, if I ask the average person to do something in seven days, they're probably never going to get to it. But if I ask somebody to take an actionable step in the next 24 hours, they're more likely. So if you know somebody that's struggling with finding their way in life, what is something they can do in the next 24 hours? to write the ship? So I would say, um, you know, reach out, find a tribe, 
let someone know, you know, what's going on in your life. There are plenty of folks out there that will listen. As I've said before, I don't have all the resources, but if someone reaches out to us, we will definitely help find the resources. I think I can stomp the ground just like you can, you know what I mean? For, for the best of us. Um, never let, you know, what's happening to you today dictate your tomorrow. So, you know, find some solace, you know, take a, take a deep breath and, and, and really, I guarantee you, if you will just be honest with people, someone will do whatever they can to help you. Lastly, you know, I will say I had a good friend of mine who, um, you know, he told me he had cancer. He had to keep traveling back and forth from Virginia to Texas. I reached out to uh, a great uh, philanthropy, uh, you know, family here in Texas. And within a matter of minutes, you know, they donated, you know, money so that he and his wife could basically both come to Texas, get the treatment, not have to worry about any financial difficulties, places to stay and things like that. So those those philanthropists, those people are out there. And for the right cause, I, I promise you, someone will answer that. And so that's what I would tell people to do in the next 24 hours. Reach out, find a friend, talk to someone. And, and as Chris always tells me, you know, a lot of people could save money on uh, psychological treatment if they just had a friend. I love that. Eric, thank you so much, brother. I want to thank you for coming on and hanging out. Guys, I want to thank Soldier Girl Coffee. If you guys love coffee, definitely check out Soldier Girl Coffee. Um, if you're in the military, they make a, a blend with CBD and without. So order the one without if you're still in the military. Cover your <laughs> ass. But uh, definitely check her out. And uh, brother, I'm so grateful that you took the time. I know you're having a rough day today. But I'm truly honored and grateful to be able to talk no, to you. No, and today. I appreciate you having me, Richard. I, I really do. And it's things like this, like to, you know, give me hope and uplift my spirit. So you know just as much for me as you think I've done for you. And so now I can I can go the rest of the day knowing that there's some folks out there that may be helped, uh, that you may be reaching out to. Uh, and so I greatly appreciate it. Well, you know, we're all in this together. And, and like I tell everybody, when when somebody comes on my podcast, the relationship just starts today. So hopefully we're going to have a great relationship in the future and work together in the future. Well, thank you. And by the way, I anybody that's a brother in Christ, I always like to say thank you for being a brother in Christ, most of all. Thank you, sir. Same to you. All right, brother. God bless you and the all family. All right, you too. Be safe. Thank you for joining us today. Please hit subscribe and share. Please feel free to leave us a comment.